So getting into the very first article of the NEC, we have Article 9, which is the introduction to the NEC. Now, we've already covered something of an introduction to the NEC. However, this article, being the introduction, covers mostly uh, what the intent of the NEC is as far as areas and installations that are covered, not covered, uh, the way the NEC is meant to be used by uh, governments and other authorities having jurisdiction, which is a term we'll get into, uh, and other things of that nature. Now, in our previous lectures, we've also already covered some of the areas of Article 90. For instance, this 90.2a uh, here, for the purpose of the NEC, we've already covered. So we'll be moving past those just with brief references as we hit them. Now, something also to discuss during this first uh, article that we get into of the NEC here is the fact that this version I'm using is highlighted. Uh, I do recommend, as you follow along in your book, as you should be doing, that you highlight uh, your book somewhat similarly uh, to the way that this one is highlighted. The purpose of that is so that when you later are taking an exam or needing to reference the NEC, the highlights draw your attention to the more commonly referenced or relevant areas. Uh, you don't have to follow this exactly. Uh, specifically, one item you very well will likely stray from is the color scheme. You're welcome to use whatever colors you would want to use as you follow along. However, I do recommend using at least one light color and one dark color to help with a little bit of contrast. Uh, as you'll see, when we get into the NEC here, I tend to use the dark color uh, for negative connotations or for emphasis on certain words in the middle of a bright uh, highlight versus I use a bright highlight uh, just for standard highlighting purposes. Uh, the main thing, if you do stray away from the way that this text is highlighted, uh, is to just not overdo it. If you put in too many highlights, then it really defeats the purpose of doing it in the first place since everything will kind of blend together. But moving on, getting into article here, uh, here 90. Uh, again, we've already covered 90.2a in a previous lecture, uh, but I wanted to point out with a part b as well. Uh, b essentially says uh, compliance there within results in a proper installation that is essentially free from hazard, meaning if you follow the code to a T, if you do exactly what the NEC requires you to do, uh, you should not be capable of having any electrical hazards in an installation. However, to go along with that, if you notice the last sentence here, that doesn't per se mean that it's efficient, effective, convenient, or good for future uh, expansion or use. So for instance, one of the areas that I always point to is this is if we look in a commercial building, say an office, the NEC doesn't require you to install a single receptacle uh, in an office environment. Now would that be very practical for an office where it's likely that a lot of equipment such as computers or printers may be used? Obviously not, but it is uh, free of hazard. You're not creating a hazard per se by doing that. Whereas if you look in other situations, such as in a dwelling unit, the NEC will require you to install outlets spaced every so often so as to prevent the homeowner uh, or other resident from using extension cords or doing other things that could create a hazard. That then brings us to the main section, I would say, the most important section of Article 90, which is 90.2 C and D, installations covered and installations not covered. If we move up to the top of C here, this essentially provides us a list of areas or types of installations where the rules of the NEC apply. And if we look at some of the main ones here, we can see for both public and private premises, we have buildings, structures, mobile homes, recreational vehicles, floating buildings. We have yards, lots, parking lots, carnivals, industrial substations. We have installations that are used by utility companies if they are those same types of facilities such as offices, warehouse, garages, etc, etc. And we also have the shore power, 
or marinas, boatyards, and dock areas for boating uh, facilities. In other words, more or less, your kind of common everyday areas that you're going to be going in and out of. So if you think about where you go in a given day, 90% of the time, even 99% of the time, it's most likely going to be one of these areas. There are some niche types of areas uh, that are a little bit less common, covered by Part D, that the NEC does not cover, though. When I say not cover, that means when those facilities are being constructed or those operations are happening, the rules of the NEC are not intended to be enforced upon them. Now, as we'll discuss a little bit later, whether or not they actually are would ultimately be up to the local municipality uh, or the city or county building department, for instance. But, again, when the NEC was being written and designed, it was the intent that they would not be enforced on that. So if we look at some examples of that, on D1 here, we see ships, watercrafts, other than floating buildings, railway rolling stock, aircrafts, and automotive vehicles. Um, and again, these are the actual uh, items themselves. So when we say a ship, we don't mean a shipyard, we mean a literal boat. Uh, or when we say an automotive vehicle, we're not referencing a manufacturing facility where automotive vehicles are designed and made, we're referencing the actual automobile. And if we move on to parts 2, 3, 4, and 5, again, these are more niche or most often utility-owned installations. So for number 2, we see undergrounds and mines, self-propelled mobile service mining machinery, essentially most installations associated with mining. Uh, number 3, railways for generation, transformation, transmission, energy storage, or distribution of power. Uh, again, generation top niche installations. Number four, communication equipment under the control of communications utility. Number five, under the exclusive control of electric utility, uh, assuming we meet these requirements laid out through A through D. Um, now, as we progress through here, you'll notice I don't often read uh, every word of the text or go into exact details. Uh, the intent is to get the general idea here and cover and explain more as needed. For instance, with number five, if you have the general idea that most installations that are under the exclusive control of the electric utility, such as transmission and distribution, as long as you have that general idea, if you get into a situation where you're kind of on the fence, you should know to go back to this area and reference that. So again, Part C and D here provide those lists of the covered and not covered items by the NEC. But generally speaking, 99% of installations that we see in a day or buildings that we go into are going to be covered by the NEC. Moving on to our next page here, again, an area we've already visited the code arrangement and we discussed and had an entire uh, video over that. But again, as a summary, we have chapters uh, 1 through 9, as well as the informative annexes and the index of the NEC, are uh, the main breakdowns of the NEC. Now, the next area that we get into is what I would call uh, adoption and enforcement of the NEC. Um, a concept that a lot of people don't initially understand is that at the end of the day, the NEC is just a book. Uh, there's nothing inherent by nature that requires that we would need to follow the NEC when we're performing an electrical installation. Uh, the way that we are forced to uh, use the NEC is by part A here, 90.4A. If we read it briefly, we say the code is intended to be suitable for mandatory application by government bodies that exercise legal jurisdiction over electrical installations. Meaning if there is a government body that, legally speaking, has the authority to uh, require certain things to be done in a construction process or a remodel process or any activity like that, uh, it's the intent that the code is used for them as the legal document to say, how do you do that? This is called adoption. At the end of the day, it's up to each government agency at varying levels, so that could be a state, a city, or a county, to adopt the NEC 
which then essentially signs it into law as a legal document for that jurisdiction. Uh, so, for instance, in Kentucky, we have a statewide adoption of the NEC. So at the state level, uh, the state jurisdiction says the NEC is a legal document that has to be followed for electrical installations. Uh, other states, however, may have different rules or requirements for that. For instance, uh, north to us to Indiana, there is no statewide adoption of the NEC. Uh, it is up to each local county or city to adopt it. So, for instance, some cities within Indiana, if you look at Indianapolis or Allen County, uh, at the time of uh, this lecture anyway, are on the 2017 or 2020 NEC steel, while other jurisdictions in Indiana may still be on the 2008 or the 2011 uh, NEC. So again, it can be varying levels as to what level of adoption and enforcement the NEC is done at. Once a state or local jurisdiction has adopted the NEC, the issue of how is it enforced and mandated then comes up. For most jurisdictions, the process by which that's done is that any construction-related activity would have to have a permit in order for that work to legally be done. In order for the permit to be closed out, an inspector would have to come out uh, and sign off on the work that it was done according to code or according to the NEC in the case of electrical installations. That inspector is what's commonly referred to in Part B here as the authority having jurisdiction. And as you can see in Part B, it's ultimately up to that authority having jurisdiction to interpret the, co the code and make decisions on whether something is up to code or does not meet code, since there are a large number of areas within the code that are somewhat open to interpretation uh, as to what the NEC exactly meant by a phrasing of something. It's also up to the authority having jurisdiction, as you can see at the end of Part B here, to approve materials uh, and also to create special permissions or exemptions to rules. That's further illustrated in Part C, uh, in which the authority having jurisdiction also has the authority to waive code requirements uh, based on some circumstances uh, and whatnot. Now, we have spoke on, at this point, how the NEC is adopted and enforced, uh, but how do we differentiate between when the NEC has a rule or not? Uh, or whether the NEC wants us to do something or not. The answer to that is by 90.5, wherein the subject matter of the NEC is essentially broken down into three uh, sections here, which are mandatory rules, permissive rules, and explanatory material. A mandatory rule, uh, in essence, is something that you have to do or you absolutely cannot do. And you can see here, those rules are indicated by the wording shall or shall not. A permissive rule, uh, in contrast, would be something that you can do or cannot do uh, up to you, meaning you have the ability to decide if you want to do it or you don't want to do it, and that wording would be reflected by shall be permitted or shall not be required. Uh, in other words, shall be permitted, you can do it, and shall not be required, you don't have to do it. Now, in speaking on the rules of the NEC, it's also worth noting that the NEC is often referred to as a minimum, meaning you have to do at least what the NEC tells you that you have to do, but you can go above and beyond the NEC. So for instance, as just a rough example, if you take a typical installation where the NEC says you need a number 10 AWG conductor for that termination, there's nothing per se to stop you from using an 8 AWG in most circumstances. Uh, another installation may be wherein the NEC says you only have to install two ground rods for a given service, there's nothing to stop you from installing a third ground rod. Uh, or if you take the earlier example I provided wherein I said 
The NEC doesn't require any receptacle outlets to be installed in an office. However, every office you've been in has likely had receptacle outlets installed, even though it wasn't code required. The last type of NEC subject that we have is explanatory material. Uh, explanatory material is only included, as we can see here, as an informational note, essentially. Uh, it's just for reference or for your uh, favor, you could say. Uh, it is not an enforceable rule of the NEC, and there are many instances in which uh, this is often thought to be a rule and enforced when, in fact, it's actually not. Uh, and the NEC goes on to verify this multiple times. So you can see here, again, for informational purposes only. And once you go to the annexes, informative annexes, again, are not enforceable, clearly for information purposes only. Uh, so again, these should not be taken as being a code requirement, but in many instances they can help to explain things or provide references uh, that are helpful. That really concludes the important parts of Article 90, uh, which would be the introduction to the NEC, again, the code article introduction. Uh, more or less can be broken down into three large buckets of uh, bucket number one being the purpose and installations covered and not covered. Uh, bucket number two being uh, the code arrangement and what the different chapters represent. And bucket three being adoption, interpretation, and the types of rules and information in the NEC. So on the next lecture, we'll be taking a quick look at Article 100 and talking about it for definitions in the NEC.